thank you for being here. I'm seeing some new faces, some familiar faces. Um, this is wonderful. I really hope that um, the presentation tonight is a conversation um, and that we're actually going to be building something today. We're going to be building a theology together. So I would love for this to be very interactive. I'm going to go back and forth between a screen share and then looking at each other. Um, I hope that we have a really active conversation. So um, let me jump in. Our, our topic um, uh, is border crossing. Um, and we're going to look at a Jewish history of border crossing, starting with Abraham and Sarah. We're going to look at the exodus from Egypt, moving to Mount Sinai, and what that means for our people in terms of our the theology and our ethical system and our identity. Um, and we're going to kind of put all these things together to build a theology around crossing borders, a theology of justice um, that can answer some very real world um, issues of justice right now. Um, so we're going to open up with one of those, um, something that's, hap that's very current. Um, so can everyone see my screen? Not yet, Hilly. Not yet. Oh, here we go. That was a rookie mistake. You have to click on share, yeah. There we go. <laughs> okay, here we are. Um, terrific, okay. So I don't know if anybody heard, but the um, This American Life episode, The Out Crowd, that just won a, a Pulitzer Prize. Um, it's, it's about um, the Trump administration's remain in Mexico policy. Um, and so I'm just gonna play a clip. And on, on the right, you see text. It's, that's kind of the, the meat of where we're going, but we're gonna start a little bit um, before that and just listen for, um, just about a minute. Can everyone hear that? No, we can't hear that. No. Okay, forget uh. that. <laughs> um, so here we go. Um, so I'll just read this then. This is Ira Glass reading this. And this is a, um, a podcast that's, um, recorded in a kind of a makeshift refugee camp right on the border of Brownsville, Texas. Um, so in this part, uh, part um, Ira Glass is just describing the camp and he says, this camp for instance is totally improvised, long rows of scruffy blue and white and gray tents, over 700 of them donated by do-gooder groups and churches in America. Coleman tents meant for weekend camping, not designated for rain and direct sun and cold for months at a time. There's no regular water supply here. Volunteer groups from over the border in Brownsville haul in 3,000 bottles of water each day. And these are just the little 16 ounce, 16 ounce bottles like you would buy with lunch at a fast food place. So my question for us is, you know, I'm sure we've all read these kinds of accounts at the border, um, you know, and the horrors that are happening. And without even kind of getting into politics and without getting into policy, how do you create a theology? How do you have a theological response to what's happening in the world? Um, where, would, where would you start? And I'll just throw this out for now. Um, where do you start theologically when you see, when you hear about these kinds of things? Feel free to just unmute yourself and, and, and start in. How would you respond from a Jewish place? Rabbi Haber, are you able to see the chat? Oh, here we go. <laughs> yep, you've got a bunch here. Oh, this is awesome. Sacred narratives, protecting the stranger. God didn't draw borders on earth. We we're all responsible for one another. Beautiful. Okay, so these are all amazing kind of religious principles, things that we hold dear that can help us respond. And I think I want to point one thing out here is that when we respond theologically, we're also responding ethically. So any theology is going to bring with it an ethical system, a way of deciding what's right and what's wrong. Um, another kind of feature of theology, and I want to, as we're moving into this, how do we create a theology that passes muster um, in terms of justice? And so we're going to look to Howard Thurman now. Um, does someone want to read this out loud for us? And then I'll just, this is from Howard Thurman. He was a, a theologian. Um, he was actually one of Martin Luther King's teachers at, at BU, um, also a mystic. Um, and he wrote a book called Jesus and the Disinherited. And the way that he thinks about theology, I think is going to be helpful for us as we're constructing our own theological response to, um, to issues of, of justice. So if someone um, can read this for us, Dan Ross, can you read this for us? Stand there. Jocelyn. <laughs> Where's Jocelyn? <laughs> oh, 
or Lori. Go for it, Lori. I just unmuted you. Uh, what then is the word religion of Jesus to those who stand with their backs against the wall? There must be the clearest possible understanding of the anatomy of the issues facing them. They must recognize fear, deception, hatred, each for what it is. Once having done this, they must learn how to destroy these or render themselves immune to their dom domination. In so great an undertaking, it will become increasingly clear that the contradictions of life are not ultimate. The disinherited will know for themselves that there is a spirit at work in life and in the hearts of men, which is committed to overcoming the world. How would Thurman introduces us to this question, what is the word of religion? And I'll just, you can take out Jesus. What is the word of religion to those who stand with their backs against the wall? And these are, he's talking here about people who are oppressed, people who are experiencing um, systemic oppression, people who are living in fear, um, people who are living without enough food. Um, this is who he calls the disinherited. And he's thinking also specifically about people who are living under Jim Crow law, right, um, as he's writing this. Um, and he's giving us a very hopeful question as we think about a political theology, a theology that can speak to the world as it is, a theology that can help transform the world. Um, and that is religion, the theology has to say something to someone whose back is against the wall. If it doesn't, if it's not giving hope, it's not, um, it, it's not passing the litmus test of, of, of Jesus and the disinherited. And I want to point out another thing that Howard Thurman offers us, which is that um, there must, religion must offer a way of understanding the anatomy of the issues facing. So we have to have a systemic critique. We have to understand kind of the forces at work. So when we're speaking specifically of the border, um, we have to understand the racism, the xenophobia. We have to understand what's undergirding the policies, what's happening to people who are there. Um, and then I think something else is that Howard Thurman's theology is so tied not just to an ethical system and way of thinking, um, but also kind of personal experience. So I think that these things are going to come together for us as we continue teaching. And I want to I want to give an example of what does it mean to take someone's personal experience and turn it that into a the basis for creating a theology. Um, so we're going to look at another theology that comes from the borderlands. This is Gloria Anzaldúa, um, and she writes uh, La Frontera, the borderlands. Um, she grew up on the American side of the. Texas border. Um, she is Mexican American. Um, and so I'll, I'll read this one out loud and then we'll talk about it. I'll, st I'll stop um, screen sharing. So Gloria Enzaldúa, she writes, I am a border woman. I grew up between two cultures, the Mexican with heavy Indian influence and the Anglo as a member of a colonized people in our own territory. I have been straddling that Tejas Mexican border and others all my life. It's not a comfortable territory to live in, this place of contradictions. Hatred, anger, and exploitation are the prominent features of this landscape. However, there have been compensations for this mestiza and certain joys, living on borders and in margins, keeping intact one shifting in multiple identity and integrity is like trying to swim in a new element, an alien element. There is an exhilaration in being a participant in the further evolution of humankind and being worked on. I have the sense that certain faculties, not just in me, but in every border resident, colored or non-colored, and dormant areas of consciousness are being activated, awakened. Strange, huh? And yes, the alien element has become familiar, never comfortable, not with society's clamor to uphold the old, to rejoin the flock, to go with the herd. No, not comfortable, but home. This is my home, this thin edge of barbed wire. Keep that image in mind, that thin edge of barbed wire. So I'm going to stop my share for a second so we can chat about this. What does it mean for Anzal Dua? What does it mean first to live on the border? And she calls herself a border person. And I want to think geographically and physically, but also metaphorically. What does it mean to be a person who lives on the border, a person of the border? How is she describing that? Feel free um, to unmute yourself and just start talking. Um, it's as if she's not a citizen, but a citizen, an alien, but not an alien, in between these. Paul, that's awesome. What you're saying, the border is a place of contradictions. To be a person who lives on the margins, to be a person who lives on the border, is to live in that paradox, to live in that contradiction, to be both two things at once, to be multiple things at once. Beautiful. So it's one definition of a border. Keep going. What else does it mean to live on the border? Um... I guess it, yeah, it means that you're sort of also able to see, like, that, like, the world, humanity is more than just the borders, that 
humanity is better together and not separated. I love that. I love that you're, I think when you live in multiple places, you have multiple identities at once, you see how certain things that some people take for granted are exposed as falsehoods. You are able to hold multiple truths at once. Um, you could see a broader view of humanity. That's awesome. Um, we have, yeah, Ellen in the chat is saying to have a home and be homeless. Perfect. And maybe not, never feel at home in one place or to feel at home in multiple places. Um, this is great. Not to feel entirely at home, to have double identity. I love this. Um, so here's my question. How do you think Ansel do it? How does she build from this kind of her experience so she starts with her experience growing up on the border she turns it into a, a theology of personal identity she lives in the border this is who she is um where is she going with this in terms of um you know as she's talking about contradiction as she's talking about paradox as she's talking about the thin edge of barbed wire what else do you think she finds there i think living between it's living between two identities you're part of both of them, but you're also neither one. You don't really belong in either one. And there is always there's an acceptance issue. Like each side looks at you and sees the other side. You're not really one of us. So you can go to a lot of different places and see what you have in common because you, you, know, you don't have a handy label to put on yourself saying, I'm this and that's it. Um, which can be hard in some ways, but it also gives you a perspective that people who do have a handy label to slap on themselves don't necessarily have. Um, so yes, I think that's, it's like, it's, I, that's, that thing, that's like the, the barbed wire kind of. It's yes. like you're on this balancing. And I love how you've kind of completely abstracted this too from her theology, because in articulating her own experience, she's giving all of us a way of talking about what it means to live in multiple spaces and multiple identities, to sometimes feel alienated in different places. And that we can take this, her experience and turn it into our own kind of um, definition of what it means to live on the border. Um, I love this. In the chat, we have thresholds and liminality points of power. She's creating her own definition of home. She's experiencing evolution over time. So another thing I think that she's talking about in living on the border is that she sees how there's constant evolution and change. You may think that the border is a place of boundary, of, 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 limit, of limits. But actually, she finds so much potential and possibility. She sees evolution over time. And I think that's another paradox of border life. So what does this mean for us? We see we've now kind of defined the border, a place of paradox, a place of evolution, a place of possibility, also a place of limit, a place of suffering. Um, but she's able to find joy there. So we've kind of defined the border for ourselves. Now, who are we as a people? Let me share my screen. So we ourselves are a border people. We are the Ivrim. So where does that definition come from? Um, Genesis 12, one through three. Um, the Lord said to Abra um, Abram, go forth from your native land and from your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and curse them that curse you and all the families of the earth shall bless themselves by you. Where is the border in this? Kind of what, what's happening in this Parsha and Lech Lecha, this call from Ab for Abraham and Sarah to go forth from their homeland. Um, Abraham is an Ivri. He's identified as Ivri, a Hebrew. Um, who knows the root of that word, what that means? Crossing over. Ever, it's uh, other or different, right? Yeah, Julia, awesome, right. Um, yeah, and so someone's crossing over. Crossing. Right, it means to yeah, kind of... Cross over. Exactly, crossover. It's when it, Abraham crossing the Jordan to cross to the other side. Um, perfect. The Ivrim, we take our name from that Hebrew, Ivrit. Um, we are the Ivrim, so we are this people who are a border people. Um, Aviva Zornberg on this kind of move that Abraham has, she says, um, can I, Jocelyn, can you read this for us? I saw that you can now unmute yourself. Is that, can you hear me? Yes, go for it. Thanks, Jackson. An act of radical discontinuity is, it seems, depicted in the Torah as the essential basis for all continuity, for that act of birth that will engender the body and the soul of a new kind of nation. Abram and Sarai are akarim. They recognize the sterility of the place that nurtured them. In the full tension of that paradox, they exile themselves to place after place and encounter new possibilities of being. Their akarut in its double sense of infertility and rootlessness is placed in the context of ultimate blessing. 
So we should hear some resonances here with Gloria and Zeldua. This kind of radical act of discontinuity is the basis of all continuity in the Torah. This kind of paradox here, where this rupture of Abraham and Sarah leaving their homeland now becomes the basis of our story, the continuity of the Jewish people, the beginning of the Jewish people. And in that paradox, the exile from place to place, there's new possibility opens up, new possibility for who they are, for their blessing, for their family, and for us as, as their descendants. Um, their akarut, this idea of um, infertility that Sarah can't conceive, also means a rootlessness, that they themselves don't have roots in the place where they are. And this becomes the context, the backdrop of their ultimate blessing, where they, they, they go to the promised land. Um, I think, and I want us to keep in mind why, why we're reading this and, and what's happening. So we, we opened our class with this kind of, um, you know, description of what's happening at the border. Um, and I want us to think, how do you create a theological response to that? How do you respond to that in a way beyond that we're all created in God's image and so we should treat each other with respect? How do you have a sharp theological um, response to, to issues of justice, specifically now thinking about immigration and crossing borders? Um, and I think what we have so far is that um, it involves identification. There's something happening here where we are becoming a border people ourselves. We're seeing that in ourselves. We're seeing it in our tradition. Um, and we're recognizing the power of that paradox. Um, Jean-Pierre Ruiz, who's a Christian theologian on the, the third slide here, um, he writes about Abraham and Sarah crossing the border, and he says, this instruction from God invites believers to see in the present realities of people on the move. So people who are immigrating now, not an obstacle to the accomplishment of God's will, but an unfolding of God's purposes, even in the chaotic events and contradictions of human history. So how do we take the lessons from our own texts, our own kind of theologies that are evolving out of Genesis, um, and make them relevant? How do, we, how do we bring them to the present? Um, so here's kind of, here's kind of one um, um, way to do that. So um, let me stop my share for now. Are there any questions so far, actually? We all on the same page? Very really good. Terrific. So, um, so my question is from here, as I said before, a theology is always comes, brings with it an ethical system. So for example, if we say that we all are all created in the image of God, what does then that mean for how we treat each other? Someone shout this out. Someone kind of finish that thought ethically. If we have a theology that we're B'Tselem Elohim, we're created in the image of God, ethically, then we are obligated to. Why, well, I, I think um, if we're created in the image of God and our fellow being is created in the image of God, to love God is to do righteous things or to treat our fellows as we would God. Beautiful. So we see that there's, this, there's a tie here. The, theology and ethics, how we think about God influences, how we think about religion influences the way that we treat other people. Perfect. And so thinking about our experience as border crossers, that definition of us as Ivrim, I think tonight is a very poignant night to talk about our own experiences of alienation and estrangement. We go from Egypt to Sinai. Um, this experience of the Exodus becomes the basis for ourselves. This kind of experience of crossing borders, our experience of alienation um, becomes the basis for how we treat other people, how we treat the stranger in our midst. Um, so I'm going to share my screen again. And just there's a few... Um, Just to pull up a few, um, a few examples of this, but um, you shall not wrong a stranger or oppress him for you are strangers in Egypt. You shall not oppress a stranger for you know the soul of your stranger. In the world of the Bible, who is the stranger? Somebody sh shout this out. Those who are not Israel? Yeah, those who are not Israel, who else? What does it mean to be a stranger? Someone who's not native to the place that they're living. Yeah, not native. And why, what's, what is so vulnerable about the position of the stranger? Why are they particularly vulnerable? And often we, we, we group together the widow, the orphan, and the stranger. Who are these people in our texts? They're a minority. <laughs> they're they're unempowered. Um, yeah, unempowered. Without any sense of uh, support system to, to help them if they should fall on hard times. Exactly. We're talking about a patriarchal society here. These are people who don't have kind of a, 
of someone to speak for them. There's, there's no social safety net for them. So um, the widow as being someone not who doesn't have a husband, but someone who doesn't have a male relative to take care of them. Think about um, Naomi, Ruth, and Boaz in the triangle that we read on Shavuot. Um, Boaz is the redeeming kinsman who provides that social net to both of them. Um, the stranger is someone who's vulnerable, who doesn't have someone to look out for them. And so this experience of being the stranger in Egypt, obviously we've seen this before, it just becomes an ethical precept for us of how we treat other people. Now, I kind of want to introduce a, a new kind of um, element to this idea of the stranger, that it's not just about being in Egypt, but that estrangement is kind of a condition of being um, also living biblically, of, of being Jewish. And so, um, let's see, Lori, would you read this one for us from Leviticus 21, 23? I will ordain my blessing for you in the sixth year so that it shall yield a crop sufficient for three years. When you sow in the eighth year, you will still be eating old grain of that crop. You will be eating the old until the ninth year until its crops come in. But the land must not be sold beyond reclaim for the land is mine. You are but strangers resident with me. So not only are we strangers because we were strangers in Egypt, but why else? What is the estrangement here? Because um, God is sort of like the God owns all of the land. There is no like, like no human owns the land. God sort of owns the land. So every single human technically is a stranger. Exactly. Remember that thin edge of barbed wire? This is kind of how we live our life. This is the condition of, of, of our lives. And this is how we're, um, I think these, this text is, is pushing us to see ourselves, that we are aliens in this land, that we kind of live in that um, paradox ourselves of, of the land belongs to God. And this is a strong, this is why we, um, this is the reminder of Shemitah, the seventh year when we refrain from um, planting every year to remind us that we don't own the land, that God owns the land ultimately. Um, so let's take a look at, um, I want to kind of sharpen our, our question of the relationship between theology and ethics here, um, that we have this idea that we are a border people. We are a, a people that is familiar with estrangement and that feeling of estrangement, that experience of being the stranger of living on the border is something that um, teaches us how we behave in the world. Um, and I want to go back to Ruiz here that um, there's something that's so um, pressing about that, something that can help us think um, with our justice minds for today. So, he says, the moral clarity of the regulation in the Hebrew Bible regarding the treatment of aliens becomes considerably more muddled as these aliens themselves become implicated in the tensions between disclosure and non-disclosure, between truth and trickery that are essential to survive in the borderlands, between life and death at the barbed wire boundary where the collateral damage is considerable and where the most vulnerable also become the most expendable. The stories of people on the move in the Hebrew Bible are colored not in simple black and white, but in subtle and complex shades. In the world in front of the text, so that's our world, the stories of the people on the move across the border between Mexico and the United States in the 21st century are stories too often written in their own sweat and blood. So let's stop here for a second. What do you think he's referring to here? What is this, um, the tension between disclosure and non-disclosure between truth and trickery that are essential to survive in the borderlands? Think of some biblical stories. What could you be thinking about? Think maybe specifically too about Abraham and Sarah. Where are these ethical gray zones? There's a story um, with Abraham and Sarah when they go to Egypt and they pretend that they're siblings instead of married. So that's a trickery that helped them survive in the borderland. Perfect, amazing, amazing example. Um, H-U-C-J-A-R Maccabees forever is saying casting out Hagar. Perfect, another, another example. Um, of this kind of ethical gray zone. Um, anyone else? And then how is Ruiz kind of using that, creating that kind of ethical um, gray zone? How is he applying it today to what happens on the border? Um, well, maybe, sorry. Um, Maybe the thing is, is that um, you sort of, sometimes if you're on the border in like a very like tense and like situation where like in a life or death, you know, where like, the conditions are horrible, you might sometimes have to use trickery to survive. 
Exactly. That's Charlie. Beautiful. And I think we kind of think of this too as, I mean, this is a little bit off topic, but as reverse midrash to kind of take the experiences of people who are on the move in the 20th, 20th, 21st century um, and to read them and then read back into our text and maybe help us understand Abraham and Sarah a little better, maybe understand the Israelites as they're wandering in the desert. Um, so that's terrific. Ruby, do you have something to say? Yeah, it, it, it brings up for me the success in a way of of Jews when they got here, the traveling tinkers who went and started the department stores, etc. That started off by smuggling across borders in Europe. Because mm -hmm. if you were on a border, um, you you had to figure out if you had no other way to make money. If you had some goods on one side, you brought it to the other side. Mm. In fact, one of the czars banned, banned Jews from living near the borders because we were always crossing over to um, smuggle and smuggling became tinkering. Nice. And um, so it was survival and in, in big survival, let's mm. say. Nice. Thank you. And also learning many languages, because when you live on the border, and if you live on a border that's like three or four borders, and the, yeah, the, exactly. the jump rope of a border that keeps moving. Living you between know all multiple those cultures. Languages. Yes, beautiful. That's a great example. Thank you. Um, living between multiple cultures. Does anyone here identify as an Ivri, as a border person? And what does that mean? Marissa? Yes, I do. Yeah, can you say more? Yeah, oh, let me turn the... Okay. Hi. <laughs> uh, I was uh, born in New York. We moved when I was a baby to Israel and I came back. So I basically immigrated twice. Even though I was technically a, phys uh, a citizen, I was culturally an immigrant. Um, and I knew the language, but not really the language. So that experience of being between places, um, and living between world is just my everyday existence. Oh. Beautiful. Who else is in Ivry and why? Um, I am also, I, I'm, I'm half Jewish. My father was Jewish. My mother was Christian. And I, so I mean, I, I grew up with both of those parts of me and always in tension and, um, it, it's, I mean, it's, it's defined who I am for my whole life, just figuring out who I am um, and how to fit in and where do I fit in. Um, but it's always been something I'm very aware of. Mm. Thank um, you for sharing, Phyllis. Um, I, uh, I guess two things. I identify with both the previous speakers. One, my mom's side is Jewish um, and my dad's side is Sicilian and Catholic, if you know what I mean. By Catholic, um, <laughs> so I definitely people are laughing. Yeah, you know what I mean. So uh, I I have that schism of like, yeah, that schism, um, and um, it gets complicated. Christmas, Hanukkah time, um, and also um, I was born in New York. I'm originally from New York. I lived in New Jersey, um, though also. So I split my time between Manhattan and. Um, and where my family is. So it's just like, cannot decide which state I'm from. <laughs> Terrific. I think that, um, you know, I, I, would, I would guess that in, in, at different times in different places, we all have the experience of being any free, someone who is um, in some ways alienated and in, in some ways following a trajectory of blessing that is both full of joy and full of pain um, and living on this thin edge of barbed wire. Um, so, this is deep in our text. This is kind of who we are as, as a people, I would say. And I want to take a look um, at two examples here of one, what does it mean to be free? What does it mean to be a border person? And theologically, how do we think about that? So I want to look at someone's individual account. And then I want to move us to a collective kind of how do we apply that? So we have this kind of growing theology. We're working on a theology now of, of being a border people. Um, and what that can mean. And I want us to take a look at that and how um, scholars have kind of applied that, specifically Daisy Machado. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen again, and we're gonna look first at this kind of personal account of how um, 
uh, this guy who we're looking at here is a, um, uh, a Dominican, a Dominican priest. Um, he, he has this uh, great account of kind of who he is, a theological autobiography um, called Vicissitudes of the Margins. His name is um, Angel Mendez Montoya. Um, I'll read this. He writes, this is the conclusion of his piece. My hybrid condition of being Mexican, Dominican, gay, and HIV positive is, positive is subversive, as it also pushes me further to the margins. I must confess that this is a painful place to be, but I refuse to be victimized. Like everyone else, I am a child of God. For within the vicissitudes of my story of marginalization, I have encountered incredible support from family, friends, and colleagues. And in that human embrace, I have found God's own embrace. Paradoxically, I have come across laughter where tears have been overflowing. So we see here the kind of, what does it mean to be a border person? We see that paradox here. We see that joy and pain. We see multiple identities coming together. We see what it means to live on the margins, but also this idea of finding God there. And so I think on the one hand, this kind of border theology on an individual level, the idea, the idea of, of being able to articulate and name an identity in this way um, for someone who lives on the borders, and I found this for myself, for someone who lives in multiple spaces, to be able to find one identity and say it encompasses all of these different things, there's, I think there's a strength there. So to all the Ivrim who shared their stories, thank you for that, if, you, if you're identifying as a border person. Um, now, for me, I think why this is so important is that this kind of theology and, and who we are as a people, this is baked into our DNA. We are these, we are these kinds of, um, as a Jewish people, this experience of estrangement, of marginalization, of moving between places. This is who we are in our history. It's who we are in our sacred text. Um, Richard Skeen said in the comments, it's all over the Talmud, the idea of being borderless. And, that, and that's right. So why is that, you know, how do we, how do we kind of wrap our heads around that and then use that to power our own kind of um, civic engagement today, to use it to power our own social justice work? How does, how does that work for us? And so I kind of want to take a look at an example of that. How do we look at our texts? How do we apply them um, with a razor sharp focus? Um, and so this text I, I want to look at here is, is Judges 19, 27, 30. Um, and this is kind of a story about being borderless, of not having a place called home and the, and the dangers of that. Um, and then Daisy Machado, who's a, um, a, a professor at Union Theological Seminary, um, she, writes about, she writes about how this story kind of applies to the women who experience um, migration on the, on the Mexican, southern Mexican border. Um, so I'll just give a summary. Is anyone, is anyone familiar with Judges 19? Someone, does someone have a, a summary at their fingertips? Just a quick summary of what happens um, with the, the Levite's concubine. It's a, it's a terrible and horrific story, um, but it's one in our texts. So I'll do, I'll do a quick one. Um, so a Levite is a, is a person who doesn't have a, works in the temple, doesn't have necessarily a, a tribal home. Um, and so we're reading about this Levite who has a concubine, kind of a second class wife status. She's unnamed in the text. We don't know who she is. Um, they're moving from her family's home. They're going back to where they live, um, but they end up in the middle of kind of a town in Benjamin that they, they don't know and they're taken in for a night. And it's kind of a Sodom and Gomorrah rewriting of that gone wrong, where the townspeople come and knock on the door um, and the man who's given them, um, who's hosting them, they throw the Levite's concubine out to, to be with the mob. And she's, she's tortured, brutally tortured, you know, um, abused all night. And she ends up back on the threshold of the door and the Levite finds her there in the morning um, and she doesn't get up. He puts her on a donkey. When he gets home, um, he cuts her body into 12 different pieces and then sends it out to the tribes as kind of this warning, this kind of... Um, that this idea that we all bear a collective responsibility for her death. Um, and so it's the story, I think, of um, a horrific story, but a story that kind of goes, this is something that has gone terribly wrong in Israel. And this is kind of playing out on the body of a woman. Um, and I want to share kind of what Daisy Machado, how she reads this story um, and how she creates a theology around it. So she writes, like the unnamed woman, thousands of the undocumented women who cross the border into the United States have faced rape, violence, and even torture. Yet they remain faceless to us, hard to envision. Their pain and suffering go unnoticed. These women fade and recede further into the margins of this society. Their humanity and their plight are lost to us in the politicized anti-immigrant public discourse so prevalent across the nation. They remain unnamed and unprotected. 
They belong to us, though, to the community of women who, motivated by faith and a strong commitment to justice, believe that these voiceless and displaced women are our sisters. These women represent us. They are us because, like us, they are the created in the image of God. And above all, the injustice that afflicts them is not only an affront to their humanity and dignity, but also a challenge to our gender-based discourse about justice and the self-worth of women across the globe. So let's stop there for a second. What's happening in Daisy Machado's work? Let's take that apart for a second. What do you notice that she's doing? How is she taking the story of the unnamed woman and creating kind of a theology and an ethic around it, a collective ethic? What is she saying? Um, I think she's saying basically that the experience of that unnamed woman is to some degree the experience of all women. Say more about that. Well, just that on varying levels, the um, culturally the world has um, is run under a patriarchy. And so women basically are given uh, the bottom part of what is possible or um, what is defined as the other. Beautiful. Um, any other reactions to that? Thank you for sharing that, Yo. I think it's also saying that all these people are suffering like this and basically the rest of us, we, it's not big, it's, doesn't penetrate our consciousness that much. I mean, some people are just out and out callous and just don't care or think they deserve it because they shouldn't have come here anyway or for whatever reason. Um, and either people who have a lot of empathy, like what can you do about it? You know, it's, it's, so it's like they don't matter. These horrible things are happening to people and it's like we dehumanize them because it's too painful to actually like look them in the eye metaphorically and mm -hmm. recognize that there's a human being in there who feels just like we do and imagine how much they have to be suffering. And it's too painful to think about that. So it's easier to just put it on the side or dehumanize or not think about it which is completely unethical and horrible, but, but you don't know how to fix it. Yeah, exactly. And I, I, bring this, I bring this text to us today because I think, you know, if we're, if we're kind of encountering these, these horrific stories in our, you know, if you, look, you can't look at the, at the times or, or listen to a podcast, anything, without seeing these the stories of, you know, these horrors that happen at the border, mm -hmm. how do we as a, as a Jewish people respond? How do you respond Jewishly to this? Um, how do you create a theology that speaks both personally, collectively, ethically? Um, how, do you, how do you do that? That also is not really, you don't need to be a policy expert to give a kind of a moral argument against what you see and hear. And I think Daisy Machado is doing that in such a beautiful example um, for us to look at, that she is kind of taking the story of the unnamed woman, um, also someone who is a border person, who lives in multiple spaces and um, and places in, in our text um, and, and applying it to the experience of women on the border and showing us how we are all kind of through the experience of alienation and, and the experience of, um, of, of, of estrangement that we are her as well, that this is, this is us, this is our story. Um, so any kind of, any responses to this? Does anyone, is this two, resonating for you? Yeah. Two, two things um, come up for me. Um, uh, one is, um, I was looking up who it was, Abraham Joshua Heschel, few yeah. are guilty, but all are responsible. And the other is something that Ruth Messenger always says, which is that we can't retreat to the convenience of being overwhelmed. Mm. Because we are responsible. And those are the things that come to mind for me. Thanks, Lori. Um, one thing that I find really interesting about this story of the concubine is like, it kind of marks, like, it's it's kind of like the Israelites, like, at the lowest of the low, like it's it's kind of anarchy and it kind of marks like the, the it's right before we start to kind of get into the era of the kings. Um, because like it, it it happens because I mean in my opinion like this this whole incident happens because there's such anarchy and like th there's just no morals. And this story like marks when when we shift into having kings and having better legislation and laws. And I think that it can really like, it's like, 
the thing that um, Daisy Machado, I believe was her name, you mentioned? Yeah. Yes. So, like, the thing I put that, the text like, in the chat, too. Okay. So she's talking about, like, these women having horrible experiences, especially crossing borders today. And I think we need that, that shift in our societal thought process to towards, you know, more protections for women and like just just like right after with the concubine story like we started to have more moral laws like right now we also need to have more morality in our society yeah julia beautiful a call for justice based on our biblical text nice um, how do you how do you raise your i can't find where to raise your hand but you go like this hand raising um i actually well i like how well, Julia was saying it, it, it um, the, after the demoralizing, it just seemed to bring about more moral laws. I'm only going to go political on this one sentence. I guess I support Trump's border wall idea as much as I support the Jerusalem wall, because walls don't keep people out or keep people in. They do, they do the opposite historically. So I really just think that there ought to be in this time period some historical morality check on our part about we're trying to put up all these walls. We're trying to say who's American, who is not. And it's like, we're going to eventually have to fess up to what's actually happening. And we're going to have to resolve everything. It's going to have to be like a moral cleanup at a certain point. I don't know what though. Yeah, and it, beautiful. Thank you, Paul. I, I think that's what you're saying is, is kind of what we've seen, that borders are permeable, that they are places of paradox where they might seem um, can, you know, completely confined, but actually expansive as well. Um, Renee in the chat has said that we can't talk about borderlines without talking about power. That's exactly right. The vulnerability, the powerlessness that comes with the experience of living on the border. Um, border, she says, border dwellers don't necessarily have equal power. Who gets to cross over? Who comes back alive? I think all of these questions, um, these are the questions we should be asking as we're thinking about ourselves as a border people, thinking about our, um, if you think about yourself as an Ivrim, or you think about your, our collective identity as Ivrim. Um, I think this is a, a tremendous kind of theology to, to launch questions about justice, critical questions about um, how we move in the world and who we are and, and um, how we define ourselves and other people. Um, Alexandra. Yeah. Um... I, I guess I'm having a little bit of trouble in terms of the analogy. I think on one hand, as Ivrim, as border people, as having this historical background, we have certain literacies and um, understandings of experiences that people are having now. But at the same time, we just are currently experiencing mo most people, most Jews in America are currently experiencing way less precarity. I mean, just way less danger and actual powerlessness than, for example, the people on the Mexico US. And so I guess, I mean, so it, I guess I'm just wondering sort of what are the limits of the analogy in some ways? Definitely, I think the limits are the same of the limits of um... We were, we were strangers in Egypt and, and we know the stranger. I think it's this, the same kind of limit. I think that's a, exactly right, that this is a, a theological response that should lead to kind of a sharp critique of, of policy or a sharp um, a, a, a response to what's happening in the world today. I think it's just a place to, to begin the conversation. Nice. Anyone else on that? Yeah. Um, yeah. Hannah, go for it. Oh. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Um, I guess I just wanted to share a little bit about my personal experience. I spent two summers working at a family detention facility in Southern Texas. Um, and many of the women I worked with were fleeing violence in Central America. Um, and there was an incredible amount of <laughs> re-traumatization within the detention facility. And um, I think what the most shocking was to many of the families that I worked with were the prison guards who were um, also from Hispanic origin, so first generation or second generation in the United States who spoke Spanish as native speakers, so they really identified with these individuals and who were really horrific in the manner that they spoke to them, like, why did you come to this country? We don't want you here. Don't you see the president we elected? Like, your problems aren't our problems. Don't you think you'll have the same gang violence you're fleeing in your country? Um, so I think the issue 
is that those individuals are trying to differentiate themselves from the new migrants, right? And mm -hmm. I think this huge issue of us versus them, right? And if we're saying we're all in the image of God, and then if we start to make these barriers, so then we become accepted in society, um, I think that continues the alienization of, you know, because you don't want to be in that other group. Um, and I think if we're talking about like the brutalization of women, the legislation that's taking place and the women coming from Central America who were fleeing gender-based violence, who previously were able to get asylum. Um, and then Jeff Sessions kind of got rid of that <laughs> um, when he um, basically referred a case to himself. So I think when we're asking ourselves what we can be doing now, I think there's a lot of policy work going on and you know we can connect that into we were the strangers once in nice. Egypt. Uh, for me, it doesn't matter which side of the border our sister is on, their blood cries out from the ground and we have to do something about it or be held responsible. That uh, even if it's, in, if it's immigrants or if it's people suffering from human trafficking that are inside the border or outside the border, what I want to do is throw a mat over the barbed wire and remove that, that sharp edge. Nice. Thanks, Jim. Ruby, did you have something? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I've been like waving for like 10 minutes. Sorry. Um, a couple of things way back since names. I, I think for it to get through to people, because it, it's, I think, yeah, we need to do this and we need to do that. But somehow there's something that won't get through to people till those unnamed people are named. It's very clear, unnamed, unnamed. The concubine is unnamed. She talks about unnamed. And there's even a poem saying everybody has a name. Um, so there's, there's something about bringing it home to people that that's a, a space before or in transit to where we can get policies, et cetera. People don't, you know, you're not a person if you don't have a name. If you're not a person, then it doesn't matter. Um, and I think for Jews, our name, we need to remember that we have a name that, we have names that changed. You know, uh, it wasn't Tilly or Max in the old country. We became named American names. Mm. We got different names. Um, and so there's something about names that's really sticking with me. Nice. And um, the, 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 the song, they were just refugees, names people, Maria, mm. this one, that name, that name, and some, and um, in memorials or the Vietnam Memorial, having the names made such a difference mm. to people. I don't know how we bring that, the names there, but it seems to be in my mind something that we need to do. Right, thank you, Ruby. I, um, I think that's exactly right, naming these things. And I think naming ourselves is a piece of that, naming ourselves as a, as a people of, of, of borders who know that borders are permeable even when they seem um, not to be. And I, I, I wanna close now with kind of, um, you know, what this, this kind of the theology of Ivrim and being an Ivri has meant for me and where I've kind of found this in my own life um, right now. And it's not actually um, in terms of immigration, but actually crossing another border, another boundary, which is that the uh, prison walls. Um, and so I work with a, a prison congregation. And I think um, being a, a border crosser, being someone um, having a theology that pushes you to see boundaries as that are that are taken as set as actually permeable. Um, I think that in all areas of our life as we have to think, you know, how can we, how can we remove these barriers that, that, that exist between people? And so um, I want to share a, a theology that um, I've learned from the congregation I work with at Northern State Prison, the um, chief cornerstone house of freedom. And so this is something that, um, that they wrote. Um, and to me, this is kind of how uh, border theology can play out in the world and why it is, is kind of um, so beautiful and important to think in this way. Um, so this is, uh, this is from their application. They joined the Union for Reform Judaism, and this was part of their application. Um, they, they say that God promised us a time when the world would be united like never before, when all people would share common belief and purpose. Our congregation wishes to share a partnership communication with the URJ to inspire all in the message of redemption, 
No matter how far, how diverse, how dispersed, every Jew remains part of one indivisible whole. Every Jew holds the power through just one portion with one word to tip the scales and bring about salvation to the world. Um, so I bring this as kind of this example of, of what it means to be an Ivri, an Ivriam today. I think, it, I think we've, we've shared a lot of that today of how, what it means to exist in multiple spaces, to hold um, different pieces of identity together, to recognize um, the DNA in our Jewish people, that this is who we are as a people. But then how does that play out? How does it make us um, you know, sharper fighters for justice? How does it push us to go into different kinds of spaces? Um, and then what are the theologies that come out of that? And for me, the way I've seen it play out is, is that um, I've learned from these guys at Northern State Prison um, this beautiful lesson of what it means to be part of an indivisible whole, that when these boundaries, when we see them as per permeable and we see ourselves as border people and are crossing different borders and boundaries in this way, um, we kind of find, find, a new, um, find new definitions of God and new definitions of, of peoplehood and spirituality. Um, so thank you all for that. Thank you for, for joining me tonight. Um, I really enjoyed our, our conversation and I hope in some way that this was um, um, fun or enlightening and uh, that you have um, are thinking about theology in a new way. Theology is um, as personal, as, as collective, as a way of sharpening an ethical system, um, a way of taking our biblical texts and, and, and bringing them to bear um, on the many social issues that we see, we see in our world. So thank you.